Bon après-midi, tout le monde. Uh, about 18 months ago, I was invited actually in, a, in another room in this uh, building to lecture. And uh, the prof who invited me, uh, having noticed on my profile that I speak French, asked if I could present in French. And I was thrilled with the perspective, so I prepared all my slides in French. I brushed up on my terminology, and I arrived uh, here, and in the auditorium, when we asked the students, two-thirds of the young people wanted the lecture in English. <laughs> I did do it in French after all this preparation. I wasn't going to. Uh, but I learned a lesson. Number one, do not assume a French audience wanted it in French always. Uh, and number two, I learned also, do not challenge yourself at the bottom of a, a jet lag which is where we are today. <laughs> so t today I would like to tell you um, a little uh, story of change. You heard from Fawaz about the uh, one type of change that happens in higher education institutions, which is uh, put it, plan it, get the approval, convince everybody, and so on. And it's a, it's a tremendous task. I know exactly, you know, some people say that uh, any collaboration between two institutions yeah. at Harvard is an act of God. But uh, what I would like to tell you uh, today is a story of a different type of change. And that story is from my own uh, institution. So uh, OCAD is the Ontario College of Art and Design. It is um, over 135 years old, which I understand is a baby age for the European institutions. But from the new world, it's a pretty venerous age you know, to, to deal with. Uh, well, very well known for art initially, a group of seven, etc. Et uh, we have a very large design faculty uh, and so on. But we needed to adapt and uh, we needed to, to differentiate ourselves. Today we are about uh, 4,500 undergraduate students, a few hundred graduate students, and we're trying to differentiate ourselves by taking the design thinking repertoire or, or uh, 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 reserves that we have in the institution and apply it outside of art and design, apply it to government and business. So we're doing a lot of things that are really uh, almost business school, but we are not a business school. So we're flying under the radar both on the outside and I have to say on the inside sometimes as well in order to, to get that uh, going. <clears throat> in uh, 2000, 2001, two important events happened. One, OCAD became a degree-granting institution, which takes a, an act of parliament and so on in Ontario uh, to do, and therefore uh, the uh, institution was suddenly very interested in developing the graduate studies uh, rapidly. And number two, it was expanding quickly and there was need for a new building for the expansion. Um, but how to expand? Our campus is actually not a fence campus. It's an open campus in the downtown Toronto. So the land is very, very expensive. So how would we get that when we were not a very rich institution? Um, the building that you see here, the, the brick building, is actually the main building of uh, OCAD at the time. And we could not actually remove it and build a, a high-rise building instead of it because we could not disrupt the operations of the school. So we came up with the idea of building the expansion in the air without land and then connecting it to the other building, which you see here. And in 2004, that building was completed and became a landmark of Toronto. <clears throat> um, so, with, with that uh, building completed, uh, a group around uh, Lenore Richards, which is the, uh, was the ex-dean of um, uh, the Faculty of Design, started thinking about the need for a different type of education. And we heard from a lot of people, uh, even Fawaz also spoke about transdisciplinary education, not just multidisciplinary, but transdisciplinary. And the rationale behind it was that if you think about the uh, development of specialization, it's like a tree. So every time, you know, every specialization splits and knows a little bit more about a narrower area and then a little bit more about narrower area. 
and some people say at the end you will know everything about nothing. But uh, the problem is not that. The problem is as this tree becomes very expansive, we notice that there, there is a severe communication problem across those different branches of knowledge, even within one specialty. So if you take physics and you look at a quantum physicist and a uh, cosmologist, for example, right? they don't speak the same language uh, in, in mathematics, in medicine. So we are having this problem. So the idea was, yes, the, the, the specialization is going to go further, but we need to pull back from an education point of view and try to build a horizontal layer of skill sets that allows people to work in multidisciplinary teams. And the reason we need more and more of those teams is that the complex problem that the world is facing cannot be solved by any single entity. They all have to, you know, to be solved collaboratively. And we are not really educated to do that collaboration. So uh, uh, Lenore, uh, who, is, who was uh, the lead for this idea, said, how about we focus on one of the new areas like strategic foresight? And she started uh, 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 promoting this idea, convinced a uh, rich uh, uh, philanthropic family to fund a project generously, and so the Beale Center for, Creative, uh, for Strategic Creativity was born. So it created a center in the university, and the center was really keen on operating outside of the bureaucracy of, uh, of any institution. And so they separated physically, went out, we want to be agile, we want to be this and that. So all well and good so far, really exciting uh, going forward. In 2008, uh, the Beale Center ran into some difficulty because it was a complex space, new space, unexpected challenges. They also made some serious mistakes. It came to a head uh, uh, crash and uh, the philanthropic family withdrew the funding and everything crashed. So the Beale Center was closed and the founders which were in OCAD, were reintegrated into OCAD. But because, like in many institutions, as you probably all know, uh, failure is a sin, they were not welcomed with you know, open arms. They were just sent to a quiet corner in what we call like, the internal exile. So the untouchables, don't talk to them, go sit in, the, in your corner. And so, uh, but uh, uh, the problem is that this group of people was in touch with their reality outside. So they still believed that there is need for something to happen. And they didn't have any internal support. So what did they do? Uh, this is the North Richards, who is the director of the program I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, lacking resources and support from the inside, they went outside and looked for anybody and everybody who's interested to work with them. That's how I came, actually to know this program and collaborate with them. And they allowed this group of people to help them design this new idea around a master degree, master of design in strategic foresight and innovation. So again, because they didn't have any support from the inside. So she ended up with a tremendously diverse and interesting group of advisors around the table that found some white space and started designing an excellent program. And, uh, we managed together to uh, write the two thick volumes necessary of documentation to present it to the Ontario Council of Graduate Studies to get, uh, to get accreditation. And we also um, managed to do something almost illegal, I would say, which is we actually recruited, selected and recruited 22 committed students to this program that did not exist yet. Okay, so. I, I hope our president is not going to watch that video. Um, so, uh, and uh, it turned out to be a good decision. We were very upfront with the students. We told them about uh, everything is happening and made them partners in the development of this uh, project. And uh, then we passed the bureaucratic hurdle of OCAD and then it went to the uh, Ontario Council for Graduate Study. And in their wisdom, they said, what, what do you want to do? No, 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 you cannot do that. That's not how we do things here. So many back and forth uh, explaining why we need a diverse uh, uh, faculty from outside of OCAD, et cetera, et cetera. They were still not convinced. At the end, we played our last card. We said, please, before you make your final decision, meet with the students that are interested in this program. So we brought them, we put them in a the room, and lo and behold, two, two hours later, 
they came out and say, hmm, you might have something there. And they approved the program. So in 2009, this is the first brochure of program, the Master of Design in Strategic Foresight and Innovation, SFI as we call it, was born. Initially as a part-time program uh, for people who are uh, working uh, over two years period. And uh, we needed, uh, obviously, to validate. I mean, success is nice, now we have the program, but now we needed to validate that we were on the right track and doing the right thing. Um, so uh, we had to test our students outside. The first test came in 2011. Rotman Business School is the largest business school in Canada. It's part of University of Toronto, and they have a design challenge uh, uh, very uh, businessy, so they are true clients. In uh, 2011, uh, the challenge was by the Mayo Clinic regarding uh, some issues around maternity management. And uh, a group of our students decided on their own, they wanted to participate, we encouraged them. They were not invited because nobody thought that OCAD had the capacity to do so. And they went in and they won. Obviously, Rotman was not amused they actually forgot to congratulate us. They were so shocked that, you know, someone, where did these guys come from? More funnily, our own administration was so surprised. Wow, we have something here, and so on. So, but maybe this is a streak of luck, you know? I mean, it happens every now and then, something, you have good luck and, and you win. Next year, Rotman made sure the, the business uh, challenge was from a bank, TD, Dominion, TD is uh, Toronto Dominion Bank, one of the largest five banks in Canada, and it's very businessy, and they wanted to, uh, a, a topic about customer service from customer to customer relationship and so on. And two of our teams placed second and third. The first place was also by a design team from uh, Illinois Institute of Design, not by Rotman. Now we got their attention, you can believe me. And they recognized that <laughs> the first time they thanked us for participating there. But we had proven that, yes, we can actually produce graduates that can solve complex problems better than the traditional business uh, students. So just this year, uh, we participated in the HALT Prize, uh, which is um, a prize uh, uh, by the uh, worldwide competition by the Clinton Global Initiative. It has a $1 million prize. And the challenge this year was to bring a, a early childhood ed education to 10 million children in urban slums uh, within five years. They received 20,000 submissions globally, and two of our teams placed uh, uh, you know, uh, in the regional finals, the round of 25. One of them is still uh, trying to get to the final round. So, great story. We establish you know, that our success. Now, by that time, we became the show horse of the institution. Every visitor, every minister, everyone that was coming has to go through our labs, has to come to our school. We have to present on that, so again and again. You know, we have uh, now an enrollment on average of about 100 graduate students permanently in the pipeline. Uh, we are financially the most stable program in, in, the, in the institution, so obviously it's very nice. So what does this tell us about this kind of change, this kind of innovation, which is different from what Fawaz uh, uh, described. Uh, I call it emergent innovation. And there are maybe a couple of, of uh, uh, lessons we could take from this. The first is that emergent innovation is often born at the edge of the organization, not at the center. The edge is where the people are, the employees of the organization, are in touch with their suppliers, with the customers, with their competitors, and so on. They are more aware of the trends that are happening outside. It takes time for those signals to travel to the center and to be vetted and filtered from one bureaucratic level to other, and so on. By the time it reaches the center, it's, it's way too late. So it's important to realize that it comes from the periphery. And because it comes from the periphery in unexpected patterns, suddenly it's not planned, it rarely fits with the central planning. And therefore, it becomes very annoying to the administration. Like we spend the strategic planning sessions and we have this wonderful brochure about our plan, and now suddenly these things pop up and they don't fit in our plans. So what happens is that they get resistance. They get shoved away, or they get resisted, or they get you know, exiled, and, and so on, like happened in, in the case of the program initially. As described in this case, 
success doesn't come immediately necessarily in those innovations. It, the price is, could be multiple failures and serious failures. I mean, some, some of the people that were in this institute were really shunned for, you know, the Beale Institute that, was, uh, that crashed were shunned for, for years. They were like on the untouchable list. So it's hard uh, to do that in traditional organizations. And interestingly enough, when you have suppression, when you have resistance, it creates a counter movement. Uh, I call it spite. So when you have resistance, people say, oh, you think this is not a good idea? I'm going to show you what we can do. I'm going to prove to you that we are more clever than your administration, and so on. It also creates guerrilla tactics, like us recruiting 22 students, including the entire admission process, okay? with, like with the, with the folders and the dossier and everything, you know, before even the program existed. Okay? Or writing two volumes of documentation for ACGS where we knew, we actually knew at that time that the program is not going to be like that. It's going to be evolving very quickly. Right? So, so it is interesting to, to note that the more you put uh, uh, suppression and resistance, it brings those work around the systems and it creates this sort of underground economy, if you wish, you know, around the official uh, uh, system and channels. And finally, when you have no support, and no close monitoring of what you're doing, because you are in the corner there, this actually could mean design freedom. I think if we were monitored closely at the beginning of, of the process, we wouldn't have been able to actually design the program that way. So there is always a silver lining, you know, that uh, when, when you don't have the support and so on, you might have a greater opportunity to design. So in closing, what I would like to uh, leave you with is think about where does such emergent innovation happen in your organizations? Do you see it? Do you know it's happening? Is it resisted? How is it dealt with? And if we are talking about design thinking and the future of design thinking, we heard so many of the others, uh, you know, uh, and I join my voice to them, it has to be at the systemic level. It has to be at the structure, organizational level in order for it to really become significant. Thank you very much.